in the conversation at uh, home, I was uh, uh, made reference to the fact that a lot of these, shall we say, more mature preachers today uh, knew the preachers of long ago, the uh, Wallaces and Brewers and what have you, not Jerry Brewers, but the other Brewers. <laughs> but the, uh, the young people, you need to keep in mind that the people that are speaking to you t today and throughout this week, that's a link to those old preachers of the past and it's, you know, it's just passing away. Well, I have a next speaker is one of those that remembers all those preachers and has regaled us with many stories about those old preachers of which I'm very uh, grateful and enjoyed them immensely. Daniel Denham was born in Pensacola, Florida, in, in uh, 1956, graduated with the Bellevue Preacher uh, Training School, done mission work in Taiwan, and has uh, served as evangelist in local work in Florida, Texas, Tennessee, Virginia. And he currently works with the North Ri uh, River Congregation in Parish, Florida, author of two tracks, numerous articles, and further papers, and made many a liberal mad and <laughs> other other kooks kind of uh, gnaw their fingernails. My married to Barbara Stancliffe, they have three children, Sean, Trevor, and Megan. Megan's here today. And two grandchildren. So I'd like to introduce uh, Daniel Denham, who's going to speak to us on the fatal era of John Wesley's second work of grace. Daniel. He said if I'm nice to him, I might get 41 minutes. So he's trying to cut deals here, David. <laughs> we greatly appreciate your being with us this afternoon. I appreciate the invitation from the elders, and from Brother David Brown. The, always this is a very pleasurable occasion. Uh, sometimes we deal with very unpleasant subjects. But it is always great to be with you, good brethren, the, the stance you take for the truth. And uh, we appreciate Brother and Sister Cone and their hospitality, as we have also appreciated the Roths uh, as well on occasion. Had the opportunity to be with them, I think, a couple of years ago. And uh, you just got a great group of people. Uh, God bless you. We appreciate you. The subject before us, of course, the second work of grace, of uh, doctrine of John West, uh, Wesley, who lived from 1703 to 1791 and was without doubt the most influential theologian of the 18th century. While Wesley was a lifelong Anglican, he never left the Anglican Church or the Church of England, he is often spoken of as the founder of the Methodist Church. This denomination based much of its teaching on that of, of John Wesley, along with his brother Charles, as well as George Whitefield, who was the revivalist of the three. The thinker of the trio, however, was Wesley, and he has had a profound uh, influence through what has come to be known as the Wesleyan tradition, which promoted the piety and perfectionist movements, especially in the uh, late 18th and then uh, through the 19th century, within both Anglicanism and Methodism. These twin notions have trickled down through the Methodist Church of the 19th century into the various holiness, Pentecostal, and charismatic movements of the 20th and 21st centuries, including the current third wave movement that is so prominent in American Europe today. Through the third wave movement, we have uh, seen the rise of the community church movement, uh, Bill Hybels and the Willow Creek Community Church, uh, Rick Warren and Saddleback. Also, uh, the third wave movement has merged with a movement that almost died out about 20 years ago called the Emerging Church Movement. It, it has unfortunately made a comeback and uh, is promoting the teachings again of Walter Rauschenbusch and Shaler Matthews called the Social Gospel. Uh, while it looked like it was about to die 
uh, unfortunately, uh, Wagner and uh, Rick Warren and others uh, helped uh, revive, revive it, uh, but the most important influential man in the movement has been a Methodist by the name of Brian McLaren. Uh, he is the considered the top guru of uh, the emerging church movement, and the theologian that they love the best is the Anglican Wesleyan N.T. Wright. What is significant about Wright is recently such people as Don Preston have decided to latch on to him and encourage brethren to start reading his works. Well, Wright is a Wesleyan, and uh, he has influ influence. Uh, and has influenced Max King and Don Preston and without doubt is now exerting influence through his writings on Holger Neubauer and Steve Basden. Also, C.H. Dodd is of the Anglican Wesleyan movement and uh, out of that uh, influence and from him came realized eschatology or at least the postmodernist form of it which also influenced Max King uh, Dodd, uh, as well, uh, gave the, uh, developed the idea of the kerygma, the preaching versus the didache idea, that is doctrine, preaching versus doctrine, and guess where that led as far as members of the church. Carl Ketcherside studied under preachers, under uh, professors that taught Dodd's ideas and so we have Carl Ketcher's side and Leroy Garrett uh, influenced by this man Dodd and then through them a fellow by the name of Rubel Shelley. And so it goes on and on and on. The most influential movement right now or the most influential uh, stream uh, as far as the brotherhood is concerned to a negative, in a negative way is the Wesleyan tradition. Calvinism, yes, is still a deadly factor. Arminianism is still a deadly doctrine. But Wesleyanism, and we'll see why as we proceed, uh, has had more of a negative influence on the Lord's Church in the last few years, at least over the last 40, 50 years, than uh, even Calvinism and Arminianism. John Wesley as noted, was a lifelong Anglican. And uh, yet he underwent a religious experience that altered his perception of both human nature and Bible teaching. On April 25th, 1735, he was urged by his father, who lay dying, to seek a real spiritual relationship with God. Now think about that particular phrase, a real spiritual relationship relationship. Upon that advice and his subsequent trip to the American colonies with his brother Charles, Wesley came across a group of German missionaries, Moravians, uh, while on the way to Georgia. Among this number was a bishop of that denomination, one uh, Peter Baylor. Wesley and he became good friends, and he was impressed, as Wesley was impressed, with what he believed to be the spirituality of these people. His work in Savannah, however, didn't progress well, and he seems to have had a severe bent of mind, very similar to John Calvin. Calvin was always referred to by his students as the old objecting case because he was so severe in his attitudes and outlook on life, and he just uh, was a, a, a quintessential stick in the mud uh, in so many ways. Wesley seems to have leaned in that direction at this point in his life. Wesley returned to England discouraged and despondent, but he never forgot about the zeal and enthusiasm that he had seen in the Moravians. In 1738, he and this uh, uh, Baylor came together, and uh, under the influence of Baylor, uh, Wesley instituted a religious society called the Fetter Lane Society. Baylor stressed to Wesley that religious experiences were more important and that one could actually feel the love of God 
and the power of God internally. Now, Calvinism did not stress that. Calvinism had a cold, harsh feel to it. You either were of the elect and, or not of the elect, and if you were of the elect, you couldn't do anything about the, being unelected. And if you were not of the elect, you couldn't do anything about becoming elected. And so it was pretty cut and dried as far as its attitude was concerned in these areas and looked upon as a very harsh system, and still is for the most part, especially the uh, hardcore Calvinistic uh, doctrine. Arminianism was a little softer in some respects, but uh, again, uh, Arminianism did not emphasize this idea of experience. Experience. And the concept of confrontation or uh, the idea of experiencing God or Christ in a direct encounter. You ever heard that word? It was very prominent a few years ago. Ruba Shelley was using that, throwing it around a number of uh, liberal brethren, and they were still throwing it around today. In, we need encounters with Christ. And uh, again, it was this emphasis upon uh, mysticism and emotionalism. Well, Baylor stressed this. He also emphasized the need for a feeling of certainty of forgiveness of sins, the fact of victory over sin here and now. This internal witness that he spoke of was supposedly manifested in the heart of the believer and was ascribed to the working of the Holy Spirit within. Here then was the start of the heart patterns. This is the heart padding society. And uh, while the Calvinists claim that because they were of the elect, they were saved, experience did not play a big role in their attitude or outlook. With the Wesleyans, experience and feeling was primary, e even over the authority of the scriptures. Religious experience would become a form of evidence in itself. And many times, if you look at some of the apologists, uh, in the denominational world, those who are involved in apologetics, you can tell who is of the Wesleyan influence, who has been uh, uh, directed or guided in that direction by their teaching, instruction, and growth, uh, by whether or not they take the position that their own personal experience is evidence in and of itself of whatever they want to say is true. Uh, that is uh, a chief contribution of Wesley to denominationalism, if you can call it a contribution. It's actually uh, destructive in the long run. Baylor, interestingly, went off into universalism. That's where he wound up. And a lot of these fellows eventually do. They eventually go in that direction, especially those who adopt realized eschatology and some of those other wacky ideas. Wesley, however, had still been adversely affected by Baylor's theories on religious experience and salvation. At a meeting at Aldersgate Street in London on May 24, 1738, which Wesley reluctantly attended, he had an experience that he claimed uh, made his heart uh, strangely warmed, uh, made it feel strangely warmed. He wrote, I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death, unquote. He wrote that after having attending, attended those services and listened to someone reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. At this point, Wesley was off and running. He studied the Moravians in Germany for a while, even though they refused to accept his genu the genuineness of his experience. <laughs> in other words, we don't trust you. And uh, so they threw him out. And others, uh, uh, but the mysticism of the Moravians and others intrigued him. 
He especially became attached to works that, were stre that stressed religious experience uh, as evidence. Among those works were those of Augustine, Thomas Akempis, William Law, and Richard Baxter. But even more uh, had influence on him, uh, different ones who, were, who leaned toward the mystic view of things. We'll mention that a little bit more. The concept of sudden, immediate, that is without means of change, by the working of the Holy Spirit on the basis of faith alone caught his imagination. He was influenced in the writings of Luther to uh, accept the doctrine of faith only. And he coupled that with these mystical ideas and views of experience. This concept, which was prevalent also in both the respective systems of Calvinism and Arminianism, uh, coupled with this mysticism, uh, shaped his own view of both man and God. Total depravity necessitated in his mind this direct immediate change, while the love of God in his thinking just as certainly necessitated the assurance to be felt in the subsequent sanctification of the believer. But let's look a little further at the development of his doctrine and delineate it. The doctrine of the second work of grace, as noted, is tied directly to Wesley's teaching on sanctification. Wesley influenced himself, again, by the teachings of Martin Luther, studied them, as well as that of Augustine, and he came to believe in and teach salvation by faith only. But unlike the Lutherans and the Calvinists, and to a certain extent the Arminians, he separated the doctrines of justification and sanctification so as to affirm that the former was the first work of grace while the latter was the second. Further, he equated the new birth with the former, so thus justification uh, became the first step but the second work of grace he applied specifically to the experience of Holy Spirit baptism, the infilling of the Spirit thereby in the life of the Christian, and the work of sanctification. Justification was viewed as the beginning point or entrance into the overall process of development and uh, actually opened the door toward sanctification in the sense that it made the Christian the proper object then of spirit baptism and the subsequent witness of the Spirit. Thus the order according to Wesley is first justification by faith only, followed by sanctification beginning through the act of Holy Spirit baptism. This sanctification was also viewed by Wesley as an ongoing process entailing the development ultimately of perfection in the Christian as to be able even to live above sin. It is uh, no accident that many of Wesley's early followers, and even some today, claim to have reached a level where they never sin. Uh, in fact, uh, in Pensacola many years ago, there was a holiness preacher, and the holiness movement came through this system, who claimed that he hadn't sinned in 30 years. And I thought when I heard that on the radio, well, you just did. <laughs> you just blew it. At any event, this idea of perfectionism uh, is a result of this particular doctrine. The idea especially was centerpiece in the more extreme branches of the holiness movement arising out of Methodism in the later 19th and early 20th centuries, and the doctrine of perfectionism became a basic tenet of many Pentecostal and holiness churches. In the early to mid 20th century, you also had what was called the Keswick Movement. And that moved across denominational lines. The Keswick Movement uh, began with Anglicans and Methodists, but it also affected Baptists and other denominations. And the emphasis, again, was upon experience, feelings, emotionalism, and so on. And uh, its influence, even though the Keswick lectures and seminars uh, eventually died out, its influence continued even today. It should be noted that Wesley was often not clear on his exact position 
as his theology seems to have always been in a constant state of flux. At times he appears more Calvinistic. In fact, on one occasion, he openly declares that I am a Calvinist. But, of course, Calvin would not have owned him on that basis. Calvin would have been more strict about it. At other points in his thinking, he seems to have been more Arminian or even Lutheran. The latter became the most common view in his writings, or the latter two, uh, Arminianism and Lutheranism, rather than uh, Calvinism, for which Wesleyanism is often referred to as a part of the Arminian tradition. The difference centered over whether spirit baptism in Wesley's teaching occurred at and also even occasioned the new birth or was reserved for those already regenerated but in need of help in living the Christian life. It is this latter view that came to predominate in his thinking over time even though he still vacillated on certain particulars. And so when you read various Methodist historians and writers, there is a running debate between them as to just how far Wesley went with some of his views and how clear he was on certain points. The ambiguity at times in his own writings has led Wesleyans to question whether Wesley really taught a second work of grace at times. Uh, as distinct from justification, uh, such as the case in a statement by Dr. Mac B. Stokes. It'll be, in Stokes' statement, however, he did admit that Wesley definitely believed in the doctrine himself, even though he seems to be confused and imprecise in its teaching. At length, Wesley equated the baptism of the Holy Spirit with a second blessing or work of God after justification had occurred, at least uh, that much was clear. In this, he adopted the idea of the Spirit's presence in the saint as a check against sin. But relative to sanctification itself, Wesley offered a new twist to the work of the Spirit beyond that of even the Calvinist and the Arminians. Whereas both of these groups saw sanctification occurring at the same time or approximately the same time, uh, and in the same divine act as justification, Wesley came to view sanctification as a separate operation that began in some way at the same general time as justification, but entailed a distinct operation of the Spirit in addition to that of salvation. He also viewed sanctification as both an act and a subsequent ongoing process. What is interesting in this regard is how the current teachings of Brother Mac Deaver now mirror these very ideas. Keep in mind, Brother Deaver teaches that at the point of water baptism, one is, uh, is justified. He's cleansed. He receives the forgiveness of sins. But then, while he is still in the water, he receives Holy Spirit baptism. And Holy Spirit baptism now regenerates him, that is, makes him a child of God, implying thus that he received forgiveness before he became a child of God, making a distinction between those two, and begins the process of sanctification. Brother Deaver goes on to point out in his doctrine, his idea is that one is then raised out of the water, but he continues to be immersed in the Spirit for the rest of his life. Think about that. He remains in spirit baptism until death or the coming of Christ, whichever comes first. And that raises all sorts of questions. If an individual is in uh, the spirit in that fashion, is being constantly, if his soul or spirit's being constantly immersed in the Holy Spirit, how is it possible even for him to sin? And if he does sin, does the Spirit depart from him? Does he sever fellowship? And if he does repent after sinning and the Spirit departs, does the Spirit then rebaptize him, which then makes for at least two baptisms of the Holy Spirit by Mac Deaver? At any event, Mac is following a pattern and a confused one at that, very similar to that of the teaching of John Wesley. Brother Mack has said uh, 
that uh, he's been falsely accused of teaching Calvinism. He said, I, I accused him of teaching Calvinism. Well, that's not true. That's a misrepresentation of what I've said. I've said all along that MacDever is teaching Anglican Wesleyanism and in a little Arminian version of it that he has combined these various ideas. I said he's more like Wesley in some respects than Wesley is. That is, he seems to have settled on some things where Wesley was, he'd go back and forth. Mac seems now to be settled on his view that this is just the way it is. Calvinism, following the teaching of John Calvin and Arminianism, which is based on the teaching of Jacob Arminius, both affirmed in their classical forms that sanctification occurred fully and completely at the same time as justification and through the same act of spirit baptism. The difference between these two systems lay in the timing of the commencement of the action in regard to the reception of the word of God, that is, the message of salvation. The former held that the act occurred without cause or condition upon the heart of the sinner who had been unconditionally elected to receive it. The word was only a proximate cause in salvation, according to Calvin. In fact, many Calvinists totally dismiss the importance of the word and its essentiality altogether. The latter view of Arminianism held that the potential was present for anyone to receive it, even though an illumination of the word of God by the Spirit was initially necessary to do so. In this, the dispute centered thus on both election and some form of free will. The Calvinist affirmed unconditional election with no genuine free will. Man has, is only free in the sense that his morally depraved nature caused him to choose always to do evil. Arminianism, however, asserted conditional election with a kind of impaired free will. Man needed some help from God to activate the access to the ability to respond. Hence, the doctrine of illumination or enlightenment of the scriptures, that tends to belong to the Arminian, not to the Calvinist. And it became a central part of Arminian teaching, and it was borrowed by Wesley and a lot of his followers. Wesley, following the Arminian assumption on free will, went further, however, relative to sanctification. M.J. Sawyer explains it this way, quote, in the, in the theology of John Wesley, one finds a new direction, distinct both from Reformed and classic Arminianism. Wesley built his understanding of the nature of man solidly upon the Reformed position of original sin. That would be total depravity, of course and the subsequent necessity of divine grace for salvation. Here, however, he departed company with the reformers and injected the doctrine of prevenient grace, that is, that all men have received of the Holy Spirit the ability to respond to God. Into his understanding of the doctrine of salvation, Wesley rejected the reformed concept of election, opting instead for the Arminian concept of conditional election. Thus he joined the Reformed doctrine of the total sinfulness of the individual and the primacy of grace with the Arminian stress on human freedom with its subsequent moral obligations. As an aside, keep in mind the Arminians really do not believe in true, genuine free will. It is an impaired kind of free will. And, uh, and at times, they will border more on Calvinism. In fact, if you debate an Arminian, he will, he will argue with us as though he's a Calvinist. And then when he debates a Calvinist, he will argue with the Calvinist as though he's us. He will borrow our arguments and things of that nature. But they put a stress on human freedom and its subsequent moral obligations. But his doctrine of sanctification was not traditional Arminianism, that is, uh, Wesley. Wesley was also heavily influenced by the mystics, uh, especially uh, those involved in the Keswick movement. Sawyer, 
quoting or uh, uh, those who uh, would eventually contribute to the Keswick movie, excuse me. Sawyer, quoting from J.I. Packer, shows that the roots of Wesley's new twist on sanctification as a second work of grace actually came from the teaching of patristic mystics, Macarius the Egyptian and Ephraim Cyrus, whose contribution to Wesley was the concept of perfectionism. Sawyer goes on to state, quote, Wesley asserted the primacy of justification and the assurance the believer could have based upon the righteousness of Christ. However, his Arminian view of election creeps into his view of final salvation. He views the process of sanctification as one of making the individual worthy of salvation. This process is a work of God, but it is also a work of man. At this point, a synergism appears. At one point, he explicitly states that good works are a condition of final justification, which he regards as necessary for final salvation. So on one hand, he argues for salvation by faith only, and yet turns around and admits that uh, in final justification, works do play a part. There is seemingly then a double or even triple mindedness to Wesley's theology, a doctrinal schizophrenia that runs the gamut from the monar, uh, monergism of uh, John Calvin through the limited compliance of Jacob Arminius to the synergism of Wesley, who called himself a Calvinist, as we noted. Thus, Wesley wrote this, quote, God's grace is sufficient for us. All things are possible to those who believe. By a living faith through the Holy Spirit, we put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We put on the whole armor of God and are able to glorify him in all our words and works. We are then able to bring every thought into captivity and into obedience to God. Total dedication to the will and purpose of God becomes our meat and drink. By grace, we have received a faith which makes this dedication possible. We have received a complete new nature, being born of God and filled with the empowering spirit, unquote. The idea of perfection by the Christian permeates then Wesley's theology. The theme became almost an obsession with him. Though Calvin, uh, though Wesley himself did not proclaim the ability of the Christian uh, to obtain absolute sinless perfection by virtue of the second blessing, he did affirm that through the direct aid of the Spirit, the Christian is enabled to rise above sin, be perfect in love to the decree, to the degree that he feels no sin and that he actually can live above sin. It is no wonder that those who followed him in succeeding generations would come to claim for themselves a complete and sinless perfection. Others of the tradition are not so boastful, but the second work of grace doctrine came to be a prominent teaching in Wesleyan theology after Wesley. He did lay the foundation on which it rests and rightly is considered its spiritual parent. He wrote that perfection is, quote, purity of intention, dedicating all the life to God, unquote. He also described it as the development, quote, of the mind that was in Christ, enabling us to walk as Christ walked, unquote. He tied it with the condition of having love for both God and one's neighbor in the fullest sense. This back and forth between faith only and having some works involved in ultimate justification, by the way, is what we see in some of the writings of our liberal brethren. They will uh, argue for baptism as being essential to salvation in some cases, uh, or at least some of them will, and yet still contend that salvation is by faith only, by faith alone, and that we don't do anything, that Christ did it all. Uh, two views that are totally at odds with one another. It is no wonder that uh, we have such confusion as Wesley himself was confused. The key thing here is that this was impossible or was impossible uh, 
the, uh, according to Wesleyan thinking, without a direct, immediate operation of the Spirit on the heart of the saint, the direct operation of the Holy Spirit was absolutely essential to bring about the condition that he stated. So as to burn away the sin nature, the spiritual dross, as he spoke of it, brought on by original sin. It is premised then on the false concept of hereditary total depravity and at the very least the impaired ability of man to do anything about this supposed condition. The spirit must then empower the person to develop these traits and characteristics so as to arrive at some measure of perfection. The doctrine implies then the inability of the human agent to comply with those passages commanding some measure or kind of perfection on his own power in keeping with the instructions of scriptures. So the spirit has to aid the, the Christian in living the Christian life. Where have we heard that one before? This work is not thoroughly completed ultimately until the coming of Christ, according to Wesley. He maintained that the Spirit provided this empowerment as well as internal evidence of a living faith. But Methodist theologian John Miley, one of Methodism's most accomplished scholars, defined the doctrine of the second blessing as taught by Wesley, whom he greatly admired as follows, quote, the doctrinal view of the second blessing as definitely held consists of two parts, one of which has already been stated, but which may here be restated in connection with the other. The doctrine will thus be presented the more clearly. Underlying the definite second blessing view is the doctrine of a common incompleteness of the work of regeneration. Herein, the soul is renewed, but not wholly, purified, but not thoroughly. Somewhat of a depravity remains which wars against the new spiritual life. You know, Calvin would say it's totally eradicated. And that was the difference. Not strong enough to bring that life into bondage to itself, yet strong enough to impose a burden upon the work of its maintenance. Such is the first part. The doctrine is the second part. Uh, in the second part is that the regenerate shall come to the consciousness of this incompleteness and to a deep sense of the need of a fullness of the spiritual life. That's the idea of encounterment by the way, that these experiences shall be analogous to those which preceded the attainment of regeneration and be just as deep and thorough. The fullness of sanctification shall be instantly attained on the condition of faith just as justification is attained. And there shall be a new experience of a great and gracious change and just as consciously such as the experience in regeneration. That Mr. Wesley held and taught such views, there can be no doubt, though we think it would be wrong to him to say that he allowed no instances of entire sanctification except in this definite mode. We see no perplexity for faith in the possibility of such an instant subjective purification. So you had a complete process, but then it was also an ongoing process. Through the divine agency, that is, the work of the Holy Spirit, the soul may be as quickly cleansed as the leper, as quickly purified in whole as in part. We admit an instant partial sanctification and regeneration. Notice the word partial. So he's saying it's complete, but it's partial. That's the schizophrenia involved here. And therefore may admit the possibility of an instant entire sanctification. So it's partial, but it's entire. Thus Miley, who was as conversant with Wesley's work as any man of his in, uh, generation, understood Wesley's view of sanctification to entail a direct, immediate operation of God in sanctification in addition to that direct operation already ascribed in regeneration by most Protestant theologians from Luther onward including Wesley. 
are not able to cover the material, refuting it, there are seven arguments that are laid against this particular doctrine that are discussed in the manuscript. I urge you to get a copy of the book and read that material. There are two corrections we need to make on it. Under number three, instead of uh, John 2, 24 and 26, it should be James 2, 24 and 26. And then under number four, instead of 1 John 4, verses 3 through 4, uh, the evidence that one knows God uh, is, is, uh, in his obedient, is, is in his obedience to God's will. 1 John 2, verses 3 and 4. So it should be 1 John 2, 3 and 4. In closing, I urge you to get a copy, especially preachers, of a book by Reinhold Seberg. Seberg's book is The History of Doctrine. And he brings a lot of these things together, especially concerning uh, Calvin, Arminius, Wesley, and so on, and their, mutual, and their influences uh, on the various systems as they develop, the interrelations at time. Brother J. Choate recommended it because he said Seberg really blows the whistle on Rubel Shelley's movement. It shows where these guys have come from. In fact, Brother Choate quite often would say, Brother Shelley, we do know where you have come from. And we do know what this is all about. Because we've read it before you came along. He knew exactly that Wesley was involved in influencing these people. Just as Calvin also influenced them some. Arminius, Augustine, Luther, and all of these uh, uh, false teachers and we see it being repeated again and again due to the influence of the emerging church movement and brethren there are more preachers right now involved in the emerging church movement than you may realize uh, even here in the city of Houston Brian McLaren made the statement some time back that he is more into saving the whales than saving souls. If you want to know what the emerging church is about, I think that's a pretty good indication of it. It's a humanistic or oriented uh, doctrine. We'll stop right there. You know, the Hebrew writer uh, speaks of, uh, when speaking of Abel, says that uh, though dead, he sp still speaks to us. Well, that was a good example, but doesn't Cain also now speak to us? It's a, in a negative way, but he still speaks to us. And I wonder why some of these guys uh, do what they do, but the uh, uh, Stoic and Epicurean philosophers, they always wanted to hear some new thing. And it seems like a lot of people are not satisfied until they... Uh, come up with some sort of new doctrine, at least new to them, you can rest assured if there is a new doctrine that's being espoused, you better watch out because it's more than likely going to be a false doctrine. Now, the progenitors of these new doctrines uh, have no more ability to control the evolution and the mutation of those doctrines uh, once they're gone than I'm able to control the uh, Republican debate tonight. <laughs> Uh, I probably have more control there, but you know the uh, Mac Deaver doctrine. He may st still have an influence on it while he's alive, and may have a continuing influence on it on it after he's gone. But it's going to evolve, mutate, and he can't control that. So I, I appreciate uh, people, preachers as uh, such as Daniel Denham, that really analyze these doctrines and expose them for what they are. We owe, owe a deep gratitude to him and for all who do that sort of thing. And all for stand for the uh, uh, for the truth in these matters. And speaking of the Republican debate, <laughs> uh, of course, churches are not supposed to uh, endorse any political party or candidate. But there's ways to get around that. <laughs> I would say that uh, you are you should evaluate uh, the candidates that are presenting themselves for public office 
and espouse and promote those candidates that I, I know that none of the candidates on the stage tonight are New Testament Christians. So we're not talking about if they espouse the gospel plan of salvation or promote that. We're talking how closely do they espouse New Testament principles of uh, morality and conduct. How do they do that? Once you evaluate that, that gives you a good idea as to who to vote for. And I think it's essential for this nation that we get back to a standard of uh, probity and, and, and morality because a nation cannot survive otherwise. So that's my thoughts for the day. So we'll be dismissed until the bottom of the hour and we'll reconvene for the next speaker.